thinking about not giving my son a safe space to talk. And my job isn't to shame him and make him feel less than. That acceptance is kind of what I needed and I didn't get that. Yeah. This is who I am as a person. Please love me, although I may have disappointed you. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions and organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you are only listening and you want to see our faces, go on over to my YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can like and subscribe, hit the bell so you don't miss an episode. And if you have any suggestions for guests that you want to see on the show, drop them below. And if we get those guests, we will feature your comments. Today's guest is actually a good friend of mine. She's going to be in my wedding and she's a fellow actor. We met on set of a Beachbody commercial, which was a lot of fun. We hit it off. She is a former Jehovah's Witness and I wanted to talk about how her childhood was colored by being a Jehovah's Witness and how that translates into what she wants to do as a mom now and how she wants to raise her child. So I thought that would be a great perspective to have on. We've talked a little bit about her upbringing, but we've never really gotten into the weeds. So I'm really pumped to learn more about our guest today, Brooke Chanel. Thanks for joining us. (laughs) Thanks for having me. I knew that text message was coming. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I texted her and was like, so you want to come on the podcast? And she was like, this day was going to come. I just knew it. I also really wanted to do this episode today because I was inspired by a few of your comments on my last Jehovah's Witness video with Altworldly, so I'm going to read them below. Uh, This first one by your girl... 4670. Um, It's a pretty long one. I'm going to put the whole comment on the screen, but I'm only going to read part of it. I was brought up a JW, so I had to relate to this. I do think these types of groups are particularly damaging for children as children listen and believe what they are told. I remember being so sad as a small child that people close to me that were not in the JW religion would not live forever in paradise and even would hope he would die so that he would be resurrected. That's pretty dark and deep. Uh, Towards the end, they say, I think that's pretty evil to put a child through. I definitely feel I was brainwashed or programmed and so ingrained in my mind, even though I left the truth at age 13. And the next comment is from Leah9692, and she says, not only do you have to be in good standing for your own salvation, but you must be in good standing to save your unbaptized underage children or dependents. If you aren't in good standing and faithful, then your children won't be saved or be in paradise. That's actually the exact same thing with Mormonism, which is a lot of pressure to put on parents. And so I'm really curious to see Brooke's approach to things and how she wants to raise her child now that she is no longer a Jehovah's Witness. Let's just dive into it, Brooke. So (laughs) tell everyone where you grew up and what your childhood was like. So I grew up in Northern California and I was actually born as a Jehovah's Witness. So I didn't really know anything different from that lifestyle. So Growing up was very interesting um, because of the fact that it looked different from a lot of people like I went to school with. So growing up, we didn't celebrate birthdays. We didn't celebrate the holidays. So going to school and interacting with kids, it was there was nothing relatable. So I definitely felt a little bit out of place a lot. Mm. Um, so it was definitely an interesting way to grow up and – trying to navigate that and understand why I'm not allowed to say happy birthday to someone that I Mm -hmm. was friends with or, you know, celebrate the holidays. And like, for example, I remember when I was uh, five years old, I, I turned five that day. And, you know, for normal kids who actually celebrate their, their birthdays, it's, you know, happy birthday. Here's your presents and balloons and your, you know, your celebration of you and your day. It yeah. was my, I told my mom, Hey, I, I'm five today. And she goes, Yay, that's great. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's And that hard. was my first like memory of thinking, like, wow. And that's so ingrained in my brain to this day. Like, that should have felt so much like it should have felt different. I should have had a different experience, yeah. um, in my opinion, of course. And it 
should have looked differently and it didn't. I didn't feel special and it, that was hard. That was definitely a hard thing to kind of deal with growing up because for me, it didn't feel right and it didn't feel like I was having a genuine um, experience mm -hmm. as a child, basically. Yeah. So what was it exactly, for those who aren't aware, and even for myself, I'm a little fuzzy on the details as to why Jehovah's Witnesses don't celebrate holidays or birthdays? Um, that's a great question. Um, so it has to do with, for example, um, celebrating Christmas is considered a pagan holiday. It mm -hmm. has nothing to do with Jesus or his birth or anything to do with Santa Claus. So in their eyes, it's just a commercialized holiday that um, isn't really, has nothing to do with religion. So why would it be celebrated? Yeah. Um, why are we honoring Jesus during a time that has no relevance? Basically? Well, they're not totally wrong. <laughs> right. They're not totally wrong. I mean, it's a very commercialized holiday for sure. Yeah. Um, so there, but like to be so one way with it um, and not having an option to like, okay, if it makes sense to you, maybe try it out. Yeah. It's just a hard no. It's a hard no. What would have happened if your family did want to celebrate Christmas? Would you have been punished in any way? I mean, yeah, probably. I, I You're not conducting yourself the way you should as Jehovah's Witness. So... And that means not celebrating the holidays and not celebrating your birthday. So it definitely would be you would be looked down on for sure, because that's not something that's in alignment with what they believe. That's so interesting. And for mm -hmm. a religion who really centers around Jehovah, you never celebrated Christ's birth or death slash resurrection, any of that? So actually, the only thing that's celebrated is um, Jesus's memorial. So that means his um, death and his resurrection. So on that day, it's called the memorial, and it's usually around um, like Easter time. Uh, they do it at sundown every single year, and they actually pass around um, wine, which represents Jesus's blood, mm -hmm. and unleavened bread. Don't know why that's a thing. I don't <laughs> recall why that's a thing. Um, and basically what happens there is that anyone who is anointed, so anyone who is a part of the um, the anointed people that go to, to heaven, because as a Jehovah's Witness, they don't believe that everyone goes to heaven. We're meant to live here on earth in paradise. And there's only a select amount of people that go. So on the memorial, the people who go to heaven – are actually the people who get to partake in the wine and the unleavened bread. Wait, so would they decide who gets to partake and who doesn't? God decides. So, okay, so, so God decides, <laughs> but then someone's like God's proxy and says, God told me that you get to and you don't? So no, it's actually a, a personal um, experience that happens. I'm oh. not 100% sure on the facts. And I have never really talked to somebody. I think I've talked to a couple people who are quote unquote anointed, um, but I don't have clear details. But I, apparently it's some sort of vision um, you're called to through dreams or um, it's become apparent in other ways. I'm not 100% on those facts. But oh, wow. So yeah. for Mormons, it's kind of like a test that sounds like getting a testimony where you have some sort of personal revelation and you feel like God is speaking to you. And then you say, oh, I have a testimony that I know this church is true. And Joseph Smith was a prophet. So it's kind of like personal revelation. Mm -hmm. But to have the pressure of not only having that experience, but self-declaring yourself anointed feels like a really big pr pressure and weight to put on yourself, no? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I would think so. Like, how do you know for certain? Like, how how do you know? Like, oh, God spoke to me and told me I'm uh, anointed. I don't know. I don't, really yeah. don't know how that works. That that definitely seems like a a, a big burden for sure. Yeah. So you're only celebrating this one holiday. Mm -hmm. And what is that like growing up as a kid, not being able to participate in, I mean, public schools, you were in a public school, right? So they do like yeah. little crafts and stuff for the holidays. Were you not able to do any of those little crafts? 
<laughs> yeah. Um, actually, what a very vivid memory that I have um, is actually uh, I there was a birthday in class and a kid brought hit cupcakes because it would it was his day. Like yeah. live it up, dude. Like this is awesome. I had to go sit outside by myself. So talk about feeling Aww. really excluded from something. Um, it really is like it doesn't feel safe. It doesn't feel like I don't know, I can't I guess I can't explain it, but you just it, it was such a profound moment as a child to like have to go sit outside and feel so abandoned almost. Like so I'm I'm left by myself because I'm not able to participate and have a cupcake for somebody's birthday. Yeah. What were the other kids' reactions? I don't know that I remember very well uh, what people reacted to. Um, I don't I don't really have a memory of that, unfortunately, yeah. so I'm not sure. But I do remember having a lot of conversations like as a kid, people being so interested like, oh, you don't celebrate birthdays? You don't celebrate – like then what do you do like – Halloween, so you don't get any candy or like what about Christmas? You just don't get presents. Like people just were so, you know, intrigued by it. And for me, it was such a normal thing. It was just so normalized and, you know, just like, no, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't celebrate that. I don't celebrate my birthday. I don't get presents. And so, yeah, it's just a, a to totally different experience. I imagine as a kid, it must have been hard to, as you were mentioning, be excluded from that and probably not really understanding the full context until you were older. Mm -hmm. Was there any point when you were a kid that you longed to be able to celebrate the holidays? And if so, was there any holiday specifically that you're like, oh man, I wish I could dress up for Halloween or I wish I could put up a stocking and believe in Santa? Was there anything like that that you remember? <laughs> um, s more so my birthday. Birthday to me is a huge deal because for me, mm. I feel in my personal feelings on this is why can't you celebrate yourself? Yeah. Why can't you celebrate the day you arrived into the world? I don't see an issue with that. But the reasoning behind it, if you want to know the backstory um, behind why we don't celebrate birthdays specifically is... Um, John, I believe John the Baptist got his head chopped off at a birthday party. Oh, and that's from then. <laughs> that's from <why>? then. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure we might have to look that up and make sure. But I'm I, from my <laughs> memory of growing up and reading the Bible. I that's the memory that I have as to why we don't celebrate birthdays because he was killed on his birthday, and it was oh. like this huge thing and. Yeah, so it was it turned into like a very taboo event, I guess. So I'm sure there's more details on that and there's more like it more to it, but that's the that's the vivid memory I have of that one. That feels very <laughs> superstitious. Yeah, almost kind of, huh? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. And if anyone watching is a former Jehovah's Witness, drop below if you have any more details because yeah. I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> At what point then did you start to kind of understand it or were you ever on board with a the theology? Was there a point where you went from kind of annoyed that you had to follow these rules to advocating for these kind of rules? Were you ever really devout in the teachings? And if so, what were some of the things that you were required to do as an active Jehovah's Witness? Some things that um, I appreciated growing up as a Jehovah's Witness was a lot of the um, like the morals and values of like just being a good person, you know, learning that like stealing is wrong and murder is wrong. And like just some of the the ideas of like, you know, having the values and morals of a, as growing up as a child and like learning things like what's right and what's wrong. Um, that definitely was like a good structure that I had. So I can appreciate that. As far as other things that were involved with being a Jehovah's Witness, um, one of the things that we do or that they did um, or do as Jehovah's Witnesses is um, the ministry. So going out door to door um, and basically um, speaking about the Bible to people. 
and, you know, hopefully giving some hope, um, quote unquote hope, or a faith that people can kind of rely on. Um, And so we did that basically every Saturday morning and everyone does it, um, women, children, everybody, um, just to kind of spread the word of God basically. And hopefully maybe at some point um, have somebody, you know, come over and be a Jehovah's Witness and get baptized and things like that. Oh, That was an interesting thing because I just felt that if somebody decides that they want something, then that should be less invasive. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, I feel like I don't know if I, as an adult, would receive someone coming to my door very well and trying to talk to me about the Bible. Um, And that's, everyone has like a different feeling on that and everyone has a different perspective. But as an adult and being in that position, I probably wouldn't answer the door. (laughs) (laughs) Just because like, well, for one, COVID, but also too, like I don't, if I want something and if I desire something and and I'm looking for God in a certain way, I feel like I would do that myself and I would find, I I find the resources myself. I don't know. That's just my perspective on it. But, um, I always kind of found that a little bit like jarring. I mean, I remember there was a guy who was so mad that we were at his door. Oh, he literally brought a shotgun (gasps) and I was like, I don't know. I would think I was like six or something. Oh, no. Yeah. So he threatened us, get off his property. Gladly. Sure. <laughs> um, but like, wow, what a, what a response, you know, from somebody. What was going through your mind? Was it, I really don't want to be here and go like tromping around from door to door to door? Or did you feel like, yeah, we're doing God's work? Like, I'm curious what your perspective was Mm. as a kid who had to do all of these things with their family. I would say sometimes it felt good, like I was accomplishing something, and sometimes it felt foreign, I guess. Like, should I be doing this? This, Is this what I should be doing? Yeah. Um, because you're you're uncertain and you're a kid like you don't know what to think so you're trying to figure out what what you're doing and what makes sense and sometimes it did and sometimes it really didn't yeah so I don't know it just not always it didn't always feel great I guess that's actually pretty amazing that you were able to have those uneasy feelings because I think a lot of times when you're born into a religion you just don't even question it Even if you have like something weird kind of happening, you're like, well, this is the way it is. And mom does it and dad does it. And Mm -hmm. all the people that I know and love do it. So it's probably true. Did you have those moments as a kid where you started to question the religion or did you feel like you were pretty much all in? I definitely questioned it um, because I feel uh, with within myself, I am a, a person who I like to find my own way. I like to pave my own way. And I've always been kind of an independent thinker. So that's challenging in this type of environment. I questioned a lot of things. Um, When my friends were getting baptized at 12, you know, what 12-year-old knows what they want to do for the rest of their life? I don't know. Yeah. Not many, right? So to make that hefty decision at such a young age, I questioned it. And that's why in my experience, I never got baptized because I didn't know. I, I was, there was a lot of pressure. There was definitely a lot of like, when are you getting baptized? When are you getting, you know, when is that happening? How come you haven't made that decision? So definitely was a difficult position to be in, to be an independent thinker and have my own views on things while everyone around me is doing something different and getting baptized. Wow, that's really impressive that as a 12 year old, you're mm-hmm. like, yeah, I don't know, guys. I don't know. I don't know if this is for me. <laughs> did ev- did everyone keep pressuring you because you never got baptized? Right. So did I never did people keep mm-hmm. asking you like, OK, now you're 14, now you're 15, now you're 16. When is this going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was definitely encouragement, I guess you could say, of like, when is it going to happen? Are you doing your studies? Because up until baptism, you you have this 
requirement of um, studying with an elder, um, I believe, and going through like a program. So it's a program of really um, studying and learning God's word and understanding what it means to be baptized. And it's like a whole, I can't remember the the timeline on that. It's like a whole process in itself just to do that. Um, I kind of forgot what I was saying. No, that's okay. (laughs) Is that something that you did then or did you just skip that whole process? I didn't do that process. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't I didn't go through that process at all because that's when you're ready to be baptized cuz after your study then you get baptized. Okay. You have to kind of be on that track already. Yes. And have the intention to be baptized. So I never went down that. And so yeah, I just I just never made that decision. It was never definitive enough for me, I guess, to to make such a concrete decision knowing that if my views changed I probably wouldn't have the relationship I have with my family now because if you are baptized as a Jehovah's Witness and then you decide to not be a Jehovah's Witness you are considered disfellowshipped right and disfellowshipped people aren't really allowed to associate with people um it's just kind of like you're considered worldly now and worldly wow. is a person of the world. And yeah. you're really, as a Jehovah's Witness, not really allowed to associate with people. So even growing up, if I can segue, but growing up, I actually didn't have a lot of friends who weren't Jehovah's Witness because of the fact that I wasn't allowed to really hang out with them because oh. they were considered worldly or um, bad association is what they call call it. So I, I would I would be in that position today, not be having a relationship with people who I love, who are Jehovah's Witnesses, and not being able to spend time with them. And that would have been really hard. So I think maybe having that in the back of my mind as even a young kid thinking about this, my future self, and maybe protecting that those relationships because I wasn't for certain. That was extremely smart of you. You found the perfect loophole <laughs> because yeah, I guess. you didn't 100% <laughs> commit. And because of that, just that small distinction, you're able to have a relationship with your family. Did you continue to mm-hmm. do all the things you were supposed to do as a Jehovah's Witness, even though you weren't baptized? Yeah. So like going out in service, like the ministry, going to like Bible studies, which we had at the time was three days a week. So we had like a Tuesday, a Thursday and a Sunday and then service on Saturday. So your your whole life is basically dedicated to um, serving God and, um, you know, basically living out his prophecy, you know, living out his prophecies of what you're supposed to do and basically share his word with other people. And that was basically Mm. the idea. Yeah, your whole entire life was involved with it. So which brings up another topic of, you know, not being able to really pursue things that you would want to pursue if they were considered extracurricular or they did not have a segue to like God, basically. That's a great point. And I wanted to go there next, actually, because I'm Mm -hmm. curious what it was like as a teenager when you started to have interests. I'm curious what it was like with the purity culture or what that was like as far as no sex or relationships. I'm not sure of the rules. I just know Mm. Mormonism is really strict and I imagine Mm -hmm. it's something similar. So walk us through your experience as a teenager and the things that really stood out to you as far as restrictions go. Ooh. I was troubled for sure. Um, <laughs> considered considered troubled. I mean, in the Quotes, in, wor- in the world, yeah, yeah. <laughs> troubled. <laughs> but in the world, a normal teenager. Let's just yeah. Be real. Oh my gosh! Before you continue, I just have to say this, and you're gonna die laughing. So, me and my close <laughs> friend, who is also former Mormon, former Mormon, uh-huh. came up with this term called um, a more whore. Because it's like a Mormon whore, but it's not really a regular whore. It's like, oh, no, I like to make out with boys. Like, you're a Mormon whore. Oh, my God. That's so funny. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. That is hilarious. Wow. (laughs) And it's crazy how you feel so, like, shameful for something that should be kind of, like, 
you growing up as a teenager and experience your experiences, Mm -hmm. you know? So as far as restrictions and it it just everything felt guilty. Like mm-hmm. you just felt guilty over liking somebody who wasn't a Jehovah's Witness. Um, I actually had a boyfriend that who wa- wasn't Jehovah's Witness and he was a secret boyfriend in high school and I was in ninth grade. So I was like 14, 15 at the time. And that was a big no-no. And so just to like not feel like I could just be with anybody I wanted or hang out with anyone I wanted. It was very restricted in that way. It's not really an experience um, that I would want to repeat. Yeah. So not being able to have, like, of course we want to keep, like as a mother, I want to keep my child safe, but there is a level to where it's like the soap, right? You you hold on too tightly and that soap's going to go flying in the other direction <laughs> because you have such a tight constraint on it, right? Yeah. And so that's kind of like what, that's what I did. I ended up, you know, dating boys I wasn't supposed to, sneaking out of my house and drinking with my friends and like mm. doing all the things that is really like... And then, of course, I had sex before marriage. Uh-oh. like, And that was a big deal. And like, you know, it's just like, wow, just feeling so like vulnerable. I guess I just I didn't have a safe space to like say how I felt or say like, hey, I did this thing. Like there mm-hmm. wasn't a safe space to come in and like I had this experience. Help me out. You know, or like, oh, Mm. I was drinking with my friends and I got drunk. Like, I don't like how I felt or like there's just certain things like there's no way I could ever have these conversations. There's absolutely no way. And so like that doesn't feel safe to me. That feels like I just needed to behave. It feels very isolating because yeah, in in so many different ways, as you've been talking, I'm just almost picturing Brooke in a, a little bubble in a dark corner by herself because you aren't allowed to celebrate yourself. You aren't allowed Mm -hmm. to have others celebrate you. So I Mm -hmm. imagine your self-image is almost dissolved because you're not even supposed to celebrate you. You're supposed to celebrate God. You aren't getting the education that you need to even take care of yourself in a healthy and safe way. You're just kind of left to your own devices. And that's the one thing that I just drives me crazy about purity culture is they teach abstinence only. So you never get any education about how to be safe when having sex, what consent means, all of these things that are so integral to learning your sexuality and eventually having a healthy Mm -hmm. sex life later, you're just kind of left on your own. And that's where mistakes happen and teen pregnancies happen. And it's just not, it's it's not something that is sustainable for our kids, which is why Mm -hmm. I'm so happy that things are changing now and parents are starting to talk to their kids about sex and even just yeah. using proper terms for anatomy and telling them this is how this is where babies come from. Like not they're not in baby's tummy or mommy's tummy. They're in mommy's uterus. Just things like that that really make a difference. And so it's interesting. You're rebelling, pushing back. <laughs> Did anyone say yep. to you, well, it's because you're not baptized and you're not like you're not in it all the way and God is punishing you? Or what were people res- people's responses, especially your parents to this? Not necessarily in those terms. It was not like a shaming thing. It was more like, how could you do something that you know is so morally wrong? Mm. So it's more more of like tapping into like the feelings part of it, I think, more so. And then, of course, like being like, okay, if something happened, then they'd bring out the Bible and we talk about why it was wrong. And, you know, like having that whole discussion of like where where in the Bible it says that and like, you know, what what reference of book we should read to like help counteract this behavior. And like, yeah, so it was it was more so like on a deeper level because you feel so like wow what's wrong with me then yeah because you're you're tapping into that like how could you yeah you know it's the the disappointment instead of the scolding yes. which is almost worse yes exactly and the, and it's yeah it's a little disturbing 
Um, because I feel like as being a mother now and knowing what I know and what, what I've been through, I would want my, oh God, I'm going to get emotional about this because that's okay. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Take your time. I think thinking about not giving my son a safe space to talk and be able to come to me when something's wrong. Like, mm-hmm. I never want him to feel like I'm always going to be there to protect him and take care. And that's my job as a mom. Yeah. And my job isn't to shame him and make him feel less than for choices. He's an imperfect person. He's never going to do everything right. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. So I think that acceptance is kind of what I needed. And I didn't get that. Yeah. Of This is who I am as a person. Please love me. Although I may have disappointed you. Yeah. So. As someone who grew up in that type of environment, I I was very lucky to have parents who pushed back on that a little bit. But Mm -hmm. that same pressure was coming at me from bishops or seminary Mm -hmm. teachers or even just peers who expect more from you. So I can understand that feeling of being ashamed that you're not better because Mm -hmm. they put all these high standards on you and they expect you to check every single box and like you said it's just not attainable no one's perfect and we're gonna Mm -hmm. mess up and also just now that we're out if we can switch perspective for a brief moment Mm -hmm. realizing that those things that we messed up on weren't even mistakes they're just man-made sins like it's perfectly normal to want to have sex before marriage. It's perfectly normal to want to drink alcohol and that's okay. And some people may still view those as sins, but I personally don't. I think do things in a safe way, in moderation. And if you're not hurting anybody, if you're not hurting yourself, that's between you and God, or if there is a God, the higher power, whatever you want to call it. So Mm -hmm. it's hard for me to unpack even just the childhood version of me that felt so ashamed and guilty for, we called it dry farming, which is like rubbing up on each other with clothes on, <laughs> like while we're kissing. We have a whole episode on that with X X. Oh <laughs> where my. it's like, I remember going into, I don't think I told this story. I remember going into a bishop's office and I, I sat down and I was so terrified because I had been dry farming with a boyfriend and I remember going in because there was a group of people that were going to the temple to do baptisms for the dead which is super weird now that I think about it so I'm probably 15 or something and I have to confess because if I don't confess and he doesn't say that I'm worthy then I can't go on the trip which means all my friends are going to know that I'm not temple worthy which is another level of pressure And I went in there and I was like beat red and I just said, Bishop, I just, I have to tell you something. I I was laying on top of my boyfriend and we were kissing and we kind of moved around a little bit and that's it. And (laughs) it was like the most shameful moment of my life up until that point. And it's not even something that I should have been ashamed about. Luckily, he was a really cool bishop and he was like, Shalise, you're more than worthy to go to the temple. But that's lucky. That doesn't always happen. And it's stuff like that that we have to go back to our childhood and remind ourselves, that the little us's, that we're okay and we are worthy mm-hmm. of love and we are worthy of attention and we're worthy of just being human and just experiencing life and we don't have to feel guilty about that. Do you find yourself looking back at moments like that in your childhood and giving yourself permission and allowances like I just mentioned for myself? <laughs> Uh, definitely. I mean, and I think it's more so like being a mom, like going through that whole experience now, it has allowed me to kind of go there and like think about, okay, 
So what I did as a kid, perfectly normal, like totally fine. Mm -hmm. I didn't need to feel shame around this and guilty. And then knowing what I want to do differently for him. So that way he doesn't have that same experience. So it's just basically like reframing it to where I'm okay. And I'm also giving him that space to also be okay and just be a human. I mean, essentially like allowing someone to mess up like we're it's, we're imperfect people like we're not always going to do the right things all mm-hmm. the time and that's okay so and I think that's something as an adult I struggle with the perfectionism of things in growing up in, in in the religion and as a Jehovah's Witness I feel there is a level of you have to get it right you yeah. have to get it all right or else there's shame. And so that's where a lot of perfectionism came from for me. And it's something that I've been trying to undo for a long time. One thing I wanted to get into is you've mentioned to me before how <clears throat> as a Jehovah's Witness, you're not allowed to pursue anything that's, quote, worldly. And mm-hmm. now that you're an actor, that never would have been allowed. So at what no. point did you decide this religion is not for me. I'm going to do me. I'm going to do what I want to do and pursue these big passions. Acting actually didn't come to me until about six years ago. So it wasn't something that I looked into because I wasn't really there, I guess, in my process of like unraveling things. I always knew I was a creative person. So growing up, I was involved in a lot of dance. And even then, that was very like, oof, you got to go after school and you got to do your dance classes. I don't know. It's getting a little, getting a little out there. But like thinking back, like I would have loved to be in like drama class or something like that. But that was too extracurricular. That was too secular. That was too like in pursuant of my own interests. Uh, yeah. So that was never even something I could even think about. So I didn't. And so it wasn't until we moved to Los Angeles from my husband's job that I was kind of involved in the world a little bit more that I was like, wow, I can actually think about this. I can actually have a thought about something that has probably been dormant inside of my body for so long. I just didn't know it. Yeah. Wow. Wait, so you didn't leave Jehovah's Witnesses until you were married already? No. So I left when I was 18. But okay. the, the discovery of becoming an actor wasn't until I was about 27. So I left because of just other things that didn't add up to me, how things were handled. There was just certain things that just didn't it didn't resonate with my soul. It didn't make sense for me in my life and what I was wanting to do, I wanted to feel more free. Mm -hmm. And the practice of free will is something that as, as Jehovah's Witness, you're taught that we have free will, but if if we're willing to use that free will to obey God, that's the true test. So I just wanted to feel free. I wanted to feel like I can make a choice that wasn't tied to someone else's disappointment. Mm -hmm. You know? So I just, I I needed to, to explore. I needed to get out and I needed to find who I was. And I wasn't going to do that there. Yeah. And how do Mm -hmm. you think you've really grown into your personality and and found your identity since leaving? I mean, if it took you almost 10 years to discover you wanted to act, that's that's Mm -hmm. a long time. And and people don't realize it it does take a long time and the healing process is consistent. And I'm still unraveling things from Mormonism. And I left when I was like 21. So how do you feel like you are now? Like, what are the differences, the main differences when you look back in your childhood and you're like, oh, I'm a totally different person or I didn't realize I wanted to act, those type of things? Um, the biggest thing would be having a voice. I didn't feel like I could actually speak my mind 
or it would be, I don't know, scrutinized, I guess. So finding my voice as a person and vocalizing how I feel about things, that has changed a lot. So expressing myself, that was never a concept really for me. I feel like growing up, like I didn't, but maybe because I didn't have the safe space to do that. So I, as an adult coming into myself, I've created that safe space to where I can say how I feel and that's okay. And I should feel okay no matter who I'm like talking to. It should, it shouldn't feel, I shouldn't feel bad for what I'm saying. I shouldn't feel like I can't express myself. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's like, no, it does. Just, just feeling like I remember this feeling of when I was a kid and having this throat feeling like I, words wanted to come out but it was stopped and it almost felt like a clog Mm. to where I couldn't even say the things I needed to say because it would be so heavily analyzed or, oh, what's wrong? You need to get counseling. You need to talk to the elders or it just, there wasn't a safe space. Mm -hmm. And so my voice was so like limited. I relate to that so much. Where do you think Mm -hmm. that comes from when it when it's in line with Jehovah's Witness. So for me, I feel like it heavily came from the fact that Mormonism is extremely patriarchal and women are literally told to sit down and be quiet. Do you feel like mm-hmm. part of that had to do with being female or why do you feel like you weren't allowed to have a voice? I think I was afraid of what people would think of me and the disappointment that comes with my thoughts or how i feel not so much um not so much that women were viewed a different way cuz i never really got that um being a jehovah's witness i didn't feel i mean there's certain things that women can't do um in the congregation so women can't be elders um and they cannot pray over people unless they have a head covering so there are certain oh. little things that are like okay but but it's not um it, there was never a point where i was like oh i feel suppressed i guess as a mm. woman in particular just as a person um not being able to say things because it would come out wrong or mm. i would be looked at differently for saying it ha- having my own thoughts on things Right. It sounds like it stems more from the perfectionism thing and being afraid to be judged. Right. How do you feel now that you are out of Jehovah's Witness and you can make your own choices and you have a voice? What are some of the the biggest differences? We started with you, you have a voice. Are there other things that you feel are different now that you're no longer in the religion? I can hang out with anybody I want. That's fun. (laughs) You can hang out with me. (laughs) Yeah. Normally, you wouldn't be able to. Like, for example, there's a lot of people I don't talk to anymore because I'm not Jehovah's Witness. So um, that's just because they're they're personal feelings that um, I might be bad association and and which can be frustrating because I know I'm a good person. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the religion that I'm a part of. I know that I'm a good person. And so that part's very frustrating. Like people that I've, you know, I have so many memories with and experiences with that just don't longer exist in my life. And it's just such a weird thing but maybe it maybe it's a good thing maybe it's for the best it's best for them and it's best for me so yeah I mean but also that's allowed me to like experience people as a whole and not judge them like I feel like there is a level of I guess judgment not uh, I feel like that's the wrong word but there is like a level of someone's worldly, they're a bad association. So let's just not hang out with them because it's probably the best thing not to do, to not do that. And so to be able to be free of that idea that everyone is on the table and I can experience so many different types of people and not 
put them in a box. Yeah. You don't have to blanket associate them with anything. You can make your decisions based on who they are as a person, not based on what you think they're like because they don't believe the same way as you. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I actually have a memory that came up, so I wanted to share that if I can. Um, So when I was 13 years old, I met one of my best friends who to this day, 20 years later, she's still one of my really good friends. She was one of the only people that I could hang out with who was not a Jehovah's Witness because her mom was godly, a godly woman. Mm. So my mom felt or my parents felt that she would be a, a, a good person to hang out with because of that. And so she found out that I didn't celebrate my birthday. I remember, I think I was turning 13 or 14. And she's like, oh my gosh, your birthday's coming up. This is so exciting. I'm like, well, actually, I don't celebrate my birthday and whatever. And she's like, wait, you don't get any presents, nothing? I was like, no. And so one day she actually, because she would walk by my house um, to get to her house, she actually hid a little present for me. Aww. It was a little tiny bear in a little like um gift bag and she hid it in my bushes and she's like I really want you to have something for your birthday I know it's not allowed so I hid it and (laughs) I hope that's and that was the first birthday present I ever received in my 14 years of life and it was so like to this day so profound and it made me feel good I'm like man I want to make other people feel good about their birthdays. I want to feel good about my birthday. Like, why can't we feel good on the day we were born? Like, this doesn't make any sense to me. And now you go big on your birthdays. Huge. Huge. (laughs) Huge. Huge. Yeah. So I want to talk about what it's like now that you're a mom and things. Because I'm sure... I I know this is going to happen with me when I finally have kids. I'm just going to be thinking about my own childhood and stuff's going to come up and it's probably going to be a little triggering sometimes. I'm wondering what it's like for you having a child and things that you are just adamant about doing differently and what those would be. So it's kind of like a little bit of a struggle bus because being growing up like how we have how we grew up, it's you're very conditioned to like think a certain way. So I've had to kind of undo thoughts and undo processes that I've just so just like almost like second nature. Right. So um, starting to like celebrate the holidays was kind of a foreign thing for me. And then when we had our son, it was like, okay, so we're going to celebrate the holidays. Okay, this feels strange. It feels a little weird. It's a different concept because this was never a thing for me growing up. So how do I navigate this? And um, I just feel like I want him to have the choices. I want him to have the ability to say at some point in his life what he wants to do. But I'm just going to give him the, the platform to choose and to let him like experience the things that I didn't get to experience growing up and feeling the love that's behind like the holidays and like gathering with your family during Christmas time or feeling special with your family on your birthday and just like having those moments. Cause I feel like growing up myself, I didn't have those moments of like significant, like family time or, Mm -hmm. you know, like this, this is an excuse to be together and to love each other and have a nice time. And I feel like that wasn't a huge thing for me growing up. And so I want him to just feel that. I want him to feel the love. I want him to feel all the things that I didn't have the opportunity to as a child, you know, waking up on Christmas and seeing all the presents. And the one thing I'm a little hung up on, I'm not going to lie, is Santa Claus. (laughs) 
<laughs> because I'm like, I don't know if I want to tell him that Santa Claus is real because that doesn't feel right for me. So that one I'm still like trying to figure out for myself because, <laughs> you know, growing up, I knew Santa Claus wasn't real from the get go. And I had yeah. to just go along with all the kids at school. You know, they're like, oh, Santa brought me this thing. I'm like, uh-huh, <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> so me struggling with that is it's definitely a weird thing to like be worried about. But it's That's just it's because I've yeah it just is how I grew up and I'm just trying to undo a lot of things and um, yeah. I just want him to be a good person I just want him to be a good person I want him to have thoughts I want him to have feelings I want him to have a safe space for his emotions I want him to feel loved and accepted and that's yeah. really at the end of the day what I'm hoping for is to shape a little person into just love everyone and be accepting yeah. and experience life, you know, and don't feel restricted. And um, I mean, that's truly what I what I hope for him. Yeah. Loved, accepted and celebrated. Celebrated. I think that's a big yeah. thing, too. And I love that you brought up you just want him to be a good person. I want to get your perspective on this because mm -hmm. so many times people will say, well, if you don't raise your child in a religion, how mm -hmm. will they do the right thing? How will they not, I don't know, go kill someone? It's like, well, hopefully they won't want to do that anyway. But right. my response, and this is my perspective, I want to get your perspective. I feel mm -hmm. like you can lead your child with love and not fear. Raise them to know mm -hmm. that we do good because these are, this is why, because you can help other people, because uh, the world works better in that way. And give them all of the reasons why they shouldn't murder somebody instead of saying, don't murder mm -hmm. or else you will go to hell. I feel like that's a better way to do it. <laughs> oh my gosh. But that's just yeah. me. So I want to know your perspective. <laughs> that's a tough one because I, I understand, like, you know, the meaning behind it because of the morals and values and the things that you learn. Um, but I feel, I don't know, I could be wrong, but I feel like in inherently we're good people. It's just mm -hmm. our conditioning. Yeah. Um, so I think if you create, like you said, a loving environment and you are the example, right? Because it's what's caught, not what's taught. So if you're mm -hmm you know, showing what it's like to be a good person and genuinely being a good person. I mean, I feel like that kind of spills over into your your children and like what they're seeing. So I don't think that you have to be a part. I mean, I look at my husband. He wasn't raised in any religion. And he's, and he's amazing. one of the coolest people I know. <laughs> Me too. Like he's just a good human to the core and he was not raised with God. And so yeah. you look at that and you see like, tell me why then. I bet you have really interesting discussions parenting your son together because you're wanting to go a different direction, probably more in the direction that he was raised. And it's so mm -hmm. nice that you have him to kind of guide you through that and model to you mm -hmm. even what that's supposed to look like. Yeah. And he's such an amazing person that he's like, I literally will, you know, uh, follow your lead on a lot of things because like, he's like, I feel like you're such such a great mom that, you know, I'm like, oh, you're so sweet. I, it's like yeah, the best compliment are. on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he's just such a like, ugh, such a great person. And like, he didn't grow up in religion. So I don't know that it has a lot to do with that. Um in my opinion, because some of the best people I know weren't a part of organized religion. Yeah, I did a whole episode actually with Phil Drysdale. He has a deconstruction network and we talked about the stages of morality, the levels of morality. And I think there's six and religious people usually stop around the third level where the first is I don't do something because I'm afraid of punishment. The second is I don't do something because I want a reward. And then the third is maybe mm. I don't do something because I want people to like me. And then after that, it gets more into I don't do something bad because I care about the community or the laws and I don't do something because I just want to be a good person, which I think is the best place to end at the top where I don't do something bad because I want to be a good person. So I think relying more on the positive reinforcement like we were just talking about 
is better yeah. than just telling your kid, well, don't do something bad or else you're going to be punished for time and all of eternity. <laughs> right. Like maybe let allowing them to tap into how does it make you feel when you're mean to somebody? How does it yeah. make you feel? Does it make you feel good? Does it does it fill your cup? Does it like yes. how, how does your how does your soul feel when you were to treat somebody a certain way? I think that's that's the. I don't know. I think that's the course to take in that in that type of situation cuz like that's that's allowing them to like really rely on their self and their feelings and their emotions and really really tap into that, you know? Yes, raising mm -hmm. emotionally intelligent children who are yeah. connected to their intuition. And this is the last episode I'm going to plug, I swear. You got to go watch <laughs> Ashley Easter's story because she was raised in five different cults and now she is an intuition wow. master, intuition coach. She does these awesome free text messages every single day, like intuitive text messages where you can text the word intuition to 917-809-7311. I'll put it in the show notes. And again, it's free. What I love about her story is she went from being completely suppressed in this cult to really understanding mm -hmm. and listening to her intuition. And it just completely changes the whole trajectory of your life when you rely on yourself instead of these rules that are placed in front of you. And you really get to decide on your own, oh, I'm going to do this mm -hmm. and this is going to be the consequence and I'm going to live with that consequence and that's how I'm going to learn instead of just being told don't do it because you can't do it. I think it's right. so much more effective when you allow yourself to really tap into your intuition, to tap into your own morality and mm -hmm. and when you have parents who are helping you along and guiding that path, it's so much healthier of an environment. But again, that's just my opinion. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay. Brooke I, agrees. I, I, I agree. <laughs> Amazing. I agree with that. Amazing. Is there anything else you want to mention uh, before we wrap up things that you want to do differently with your child or as a mom? I feel like it just it essentially comes down to just like allowing him to have a safe space. That's really what it comes yeah. down to. And um, letting him experience the holidays and letting him experience his birthday and feel special. And it is about him and that's OK. Mm -hmm. um, and then letting him make his own decisions on things. Yeah. So making sure that he has that voice, you know, yeah. and that's essentially, that's what I want for yeah. him. Yeah. And one thing that I want to point out too, when you say safe space, I it keeps coming to my mind an emotionally safe space. And I think that's what you mean yeah. as well. All, obviously mm -hmm. a physically safe space, mm -hmm. but an emotionally safe space, which is something that I think new parents are beginning to tap into as we speak about the emotional intelligence side of things, not just keeping them alive, mm -hmm. but actually making them... <laughs> productive, self-soothing, the person in society that you want to be around, someone that's actually enjoyable to be around, someone who has sympathy, compassion, yeah. empathy, all of those things. And might I just say, Brooke, you're doing a great job because your son <laughs> is the cutest and so sweet <laughs> and I love him. Thank you. I mean, we definitely need more emotionally stable men out there. So I'm really yes. doing the work. Yes, you yeah. are doing the Lord's work, Brooke. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord's <laughs> So before oh. we go, I need your uh -huh. lean the listen moment, your sassy oh statement gosh. as the, the viral video of the toddler <laughs> arguing with his mom is lean the listen, whatever you want to say. Maybe it's inspirational. You decide. Okay. Linda, listen, use your voice. This is a safe space. I love it. Mic <laughs> drop. We don't even need to expand. That's Boom. it. Use your voice. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. No, this was a great yeah. episode, and I know so many people are going to relate to it. I really, really appreciate you coming on and telling your story. I know it wasn't easy. It is the first time you've been public about your story. So I just mm -hmm. want to say thank you for being vulnerable, and thank you for opening up so that other people can feel seen and heard and also relate to you. Of course. Thanks for having me. <laughs>
Of course. Well, <laughs> before we go, I want to shout out my newest patrons, Ned and Peter. Thank you so much for joining over on Patreon. If you love the podcast and would also like to support, we will be doing some bonus content over there, patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. And thanks so much for watching. Until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious, and be well. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe on YouTube and leave a review or a comment to help with their visibility. You can also find me on social media at cults to consciousness or reach out by email at cults to consciousness at gmail.com.